<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Sorry about that. My video didn't want to turn on there. Uh, thank you for joining us and Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to the Long Tom Watershed Council's very first public meeting webcast of 2022. I'm Rob Hoshaw, the Operations Director for the Long Tom Watershed Council. And before we get started in today's discussion, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that the Long Tom Watershed lies within the traditional homelands of the tribes and bands of the Kalapuyan people. And following treaties in the 1850s, the Kalapuya were dispossessed of and forcibly removed from their indigenous homeland by the United States government. And today, many descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron community and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. We acknowledge that we are on occupied lands and express our respect for the Kalapuya and all tribal nations of Oregon and the importance that they continue to make to their communities, including to the stewardship of this very watershed. And you know, without action, that statement is simply just words. So we are committed to not letting that statement begin and end with a simple acknowledgement. We're committed to listening, learning from, and uplifting indigenous peoples and their perspectives. And that's a commitment that we're working to live every day in our work. And we hope that you as community members join us in that commitment and hold us accountable to that. Uh, valuing the collective wisdom of our community and building relationships has really been at the core of what this council's approach has been for almost 25 years now. And it will continue to be important moving forward into the future. Our efforts to support and learn from tribal people is no different from that. And it directly supports our mission that has guided all that we've done for two and a half decades now. So again, thank you for coming in and joining us for our first broadcast of the year. Uh, tonight's topic is about the impacts of a changing climate on agriculture and by extension on our farms and the food shed. We rely on this watershed for, for so much for such a bounty of crops and livestock and vineyards, um, orchards, et cetera. And this topic continues our ongoing features of public meeting topics on how climate change is impacting different communities in our watershed and what folks are meeting to do those challenges, meeting, are doing to meet those challenges. So tonight we were planning to have two local farmers join us to share their experiences and perspectives. Uh, one of them, Tiffany Monroe, is unfortunately unable to be here tonight. Um, we do look forward to hosting Tiffany sometime in the near future and hearing her perspective, which could either be another live broadcast like this one, or it could be a recorded interview that we share out over our YouTube channel. We'll let you know, uh, so watch for that and it will still be to come. Uh, for tonight, though, we do have John Deck here. He is the owner and operator of Deck Family Farm, uh, who you're going to hear from in a moment. John has been navigating and thinking about the challenges that come with operating a farm in a changing climate, and we're really looking forward to hearing what he has to share. So uh, real quickly, just wanted to touch on why we're focusing on this topic. Agriculture is really in uh, it, it's a deeply ingrained part of the identity of the Long Tom Watershed itself. It's a vital part of our economy. Many hardworking families depend on it. Um, and it feeds our, our food shed where we get a lot of our food. Uh, we're fortunate to have a climate and soil in the Willamette Valley here in our region that allows for all the diversity and array of, of crops that we're able to grow and um, all the ranches and orchards and vineyards. And, you know, farmers and ranchers were among many of our very earliest members and supporters two and a half decades ago when we were just getting started. And frankly, the Watershed Council wouldn't be here today uh, at the same level of success that we are experiencing without that high level of engagement and commitment and voluntary work that has been put in by so many farmers and ranchers uh, to improve the water quality and habitat of our watershed. So uh, definitely- Good evening, everybody. Sorry about that. My video didn't want to turn on there. Oh, looks like uh, my- Thank you for joining us and happy new year. Uh, sorry about that. Looks like my uh, YouTube <laughs> feed was on in the background. Um, 
Yeah, so shifts in our area's climate mean that farmers and ranchers in our area are facing more challenges today. Uh, there's more expenses, more uncertainty, and climate models are predicting more frequent and extreme weather events. We've seen that in heat and droughts and more ice storms. Uh, and while there's still some uncertainty about whether the total amount of precipitation we might receive in a year is going to change much, the general perception is that summers will continue to get even drier and precipitation patterns and could become more variable overall. And that variability has impacts. And it's impacting the day-to-day -day operations of farms and how, uh, how folks are making decisions as they plan the future. Uh, so now I really excited to introduce John Deck. Uh, he and his wife, Christine, along with their children, own and operate Deck Family Farm uh, west of Junction City out on High Pass Road. They've got a certified organic farm and, and raise pork, uh, chicken, eggs, beef, and lamb. Uh, they also collaborate with the Full Farm CSA. They grow organic vegetables and fruit on the property too. Uh, the Deck family has been a longtime partner of the council's. They worked with us on a voluntary restoration project to improve uh, riparian habitat along Owens Creek and Turnbow Creek. And then they also uh, had a fish passage project to replace a culvert with a bridge on Owens Creek. And that was, uh, I think, in the 20, uh, mid 2000s to early 2010s. And lastly, if you have questions, note that the YouTube chat box is open and you are more than welcome and encouraged to input uh, questions that pop up and feel free to just ask away and uh, we'll go ahead and ask John questions as they come. So uh, without further ado, John, feel free to take it away and if there's anything else you'd like to say about yourself or your farm, feel free to do so. Sure, thanks a lot, Rob. Um, and I'm assuming that you can hear me. I'm speaking into a computer here. Um, yep, here you go. Okay. Um, I'm going to fire up a little uh, PowerPoint presentation here um, just to kind of have some pictures to talk to and kind of illustrate some of the things that I'm talking about. Um, and as Rob said, yeah, we've been out here since uh, 2004. And my wife, Christine, and I um, started here with our five kids. And so our kids um, have grown up on the farm and now they've all. Um, most of them have moved out. We have one child that lives here on the farm, um, Ella and her husband, RJ, and they run the full farm CSA now. Um, and uh, our other kids are living in Eugene and going to University of Oregon. Um, and now we also have a, um, this is, this picture is a little bit out of date, but it kind of shows, you know, it's kind of the composition of the farm. We have a mix of family members and uh, interns and employees and dogs. Um, but just to show you that this is a, a big community that we have here and a lot of different people who are um, contributing and making the farm happen in, in so many different ways. Um, so I, I, I want to acknowledge everybody that is, um, you know, critical to making what we're doing running and everything I'm talking about here, um, that this is really a, um, a community effort that extends, you know, not just the people here, but um, everybody else, all, all of our CSA customers and, and other people that we work with in the Valley. Um, and something that I think I'll, I'll, sort, I'll circle back on um, in terms of, um, you know, the aspects of farming as vital to local economies um, and to building resilience. Um, I'm gonna start off and just talk about um, some of the challenges that we're facing with climate change. Um, and these are some photos of, these, these are just things we've experienced in the last two years. I was putting together these photos and I was just struck by how many different things we've weathered. Um, this is from September, 2020. Um, Junction City had the dubious distinction of having the worst air quality on the entire planet for a couple of days. Um, and there's a, you know, like a screenshot of the air quality index 674 um, and, you know, places like Beijing, China and um, um, other major cities that are normally um, associated with bad air quality were, were far less. Um, and so on the right is a picture of um, some cows that were on an offsite property um, that we had to load off and evacuate because there were fires in, in the nearby area. So we had to rush out there, move our cows out. Um, to make sure that they weren't trapped there. We weren't super concerned that 
um, that the fire would rush through there, but we were concerned that we wouldn't be able to get to them and check the water um, if, if the roads were closed in that area. Um, here's another extreme heat event, June 2021, just this last year, 112 degrees Fahrenheit at the farm. And I'm showing this, we had, a, we had to kind of like uh, put a, some makeshift sprinklers and water as we turned our um, layer operation into a water park. We were definitely not prepared for this kind of heat. Um, and we had, to, we had to really improvise and work to try and make it through this event. Um, and that was, we hadn't seen anything close to that since we've been here. Um, here's another event just last month. Um, we had a week of snow and that was unusual. I'd never seen so much snow for so long. And, you know, in a pasture-based animal operation, um, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our stuff is based outside. So um, a lot of snow dumps on the ground, um, you know, we need to deal with that as well. So that's another extreme event. I'm, I, I threw this here, um, this next slide, uh, U.S. meat supply is perilously close to a shortage, and this is the early days of the pandemic, um, and this is a, a pandemic-related issue, but I also feel like this is something that can easily happen um, with climate change as well, like what kind of supply chain shortages will farmers face um, in the face of extreme events, um, extreme drought, um, flooding events, um, that our food chain is consolidated, you know, that we have these mega processors who process thousands, tens of thousands of animals, um, you know, on a daily and weekly basis, um, that this is really scary. You know, how do we, how do we um, operate a food system when we have these um, super efficient chains and, and um, these consolidated supply chains? Yeah, so what are we doing about this? Um, so I'm just going to kind of like go through a few slides here, um, just some things. Um, I think this one's a little video here. This is a new manure spreader here. And, and, and actually, this is a, a nice little piece of equipment we got recently um, that really beats up and pulverizes the uh, manure um, that we have um, built up in our wintertime barns. And, you know, so we want to do a good job of spreading this out on our fields, um, which will help build um, soil organic matter. And soil organic matter here is key. Um, it sequesters carbon um, and it also builds healthy roots and healthy, healthy plants. Um, and this would give us some resiliency in the face of extreme events, extreme heat, extreme drought. Um, we want soil organic matter. It'll help those plants um, weather and be more robust um, when, we, when we find, um, you know, extremes. Um, the other thing we're doing is planting diverse species in pastures. And so here's a few photos um, on the right. There are some cows grazing a um, uh, kale um, uh, mix that also has some annual ryegrass and um, uh, clovers. Um, there's a little bit of chicory in there as well. Um, and then there's a little picture of some, you know, diverse seedlings coming up. And then uh, there, here's a diverse pasture mix. Um, and in our pasture mix, mixes that we've used in the last few years have had a lot of um, different things, herbs, plantains, chicory, um, mustard, um, different types of clovers and grasses. And all of this is, you know, to have some diversity uh, in the plant life, which also encourages diversity in the soil life. Um, and I should note that this, this kale pasture with the cows looks a little bit parched, but understand this is dry land, kale hadn't been watered and this is after the extreme heat event. So um, this is it already been 112 degrees. And this is, I think, early July, um, the first week of July. Typically, if you look in the background, you see like a, uh, a like a dead pasture out there. So it's all it's all dry and brown in, in, in the far background across the street. But here it's still green and growing, which was pretty cool. Um, another thing we did recently um, in 2020, we installed we uh, traded in our, our big gun irrigation, which is a large overhead sprinkler that shot you know, very far into the air. And there's a lot of, um, it was an inefficient system. Um, and the K line or this pod system that you drag around the pastures, are, you notice that they're really close to the ground and you notice it's also really fine spray that comes out. Um, so there's less water that's required in this system. So we can water the same amount, we can keep the, the same amount of pasture green with about half the water usage. Um, and so this is something, you know, that we've noticed, you know, in the creeks 
over the you know the years that there's you know less and less water in the creeks. The the rain is coming um, more intensively in shorter periods of the time. Sure, maybe we get about the same amount of rain through the year, but it's not coming at the times we need it. And it's not, and it's coming, you know, all at once. And so when it comes all at once, it just washes off the ground and, and, and down at the watershed. So we need to be really good at kind of conserving water um, and, you know, putting in these types of practices. John. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. When we were talking beforehand, you, I think cited a stat that was really staggering that illustrates what you're talking about. Cause I don't know if people, quite understand what you mean by half the amount of water. I, I think you said it was something in the neighborhood of tens of thousands of gallons over time. Do you remember that? Yeah. So the, um, if you consider that we're pumping at a rate of about, um, say, 100, say we're pumping at 140 gallons per minute, and if we're running at 90% uh, efficiency over 70% efficiency, we have a 20% gain in efficiency over that 140 gallons a minute. So for every minute, um, you, could, you could say that we're saving 28 gallons. Okay, well, 28 gallons of water every minute, right? Times 60, times 24, times 30. We're looking at 100,000 gallons of water a month. Um, wow. So there's a significant amount of water um, that's a hundred, think of a hundred thousand gallons going, going down the Creek, um, yeah. instead of, instead of blowing into the air. And that's yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for that sidebar. Cause I just remember you mentioning that earlier. It's like, Oh, I don't know if people quite understand like the scale of what you're talking about. So thanks. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. I wasn't really having my math mind on while I was talking about this. So <laughs> no worries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yeah, it's, it's great to think about numbers that way. Um, here's another thing that we're doing here. I, I like this, I like this photo. Um, well, first on, on the left is a picture of our 10 by 10 chicken tractors. And so the chickens get moved to fresh grass every single day. And you, maybe you've seen this with um, Joel Salatin. And if you've read um, Michael Pollan and the Omnivore's Dilemma, you know, about moving chickens on pastures. Um, and so that's what this is about. Every so the chickens get moved onto fresh grass. They they put down manure and poop, and the manure and poop is left behind. Um, and it's um, what we do is we. And, and the picture on the right shows from Google Earth. It just actually went to our property and looked at it in Google Earth, and we saw these white squares here show the chicken tractors moving across the field, and you can see where they've been. You see the, like the little um, trails that they've left, and then we put water behind them and water the manure right into the grass. So instead of using a machine to spread the manure, um, the chickens are doing it right there on the pasture themselves. And every single day they get a, you know, a fresh uh, salad bar that they can uh, graze on. Another thing we've done recently is we have been grazing pigs primarily on our pastures and using them for pasture renovation. Um, we've started using them in some of our, we have um, some forests um, and there's this one property that we have um, here just across the street from where we're at, um, where there was a lot of poison oak and blackberries, um, and it's kind of a jungle in there. And this picture was taken um, during that heat event, you know, 112 degrees there. And uh, the pigs are great. They're, you know, they're super comfortable and they're running around in the forest um, and they're knocking down the poison oak and the berries um, in the forest. So, you know, we're kind of experimenting with this, you know, like using pigs during certain times of the year, um, especially during, you know, June, July, and August, um, so they can get some shade and clear some brush for us. Um, here's a photo. This is back, this is from 2010, um, and this is uh, Turnbow Creek. Uh, and you'll see, there's a couple of interesting things about this photo. Um, you'll see there's kind of a ditch running down here, and it's kind of, there's some look like some creek bank erosion. And that is from where the previous owners of this property for the last hundred years would water their cows, would walk down into the creek um, and stand in the creek and drink and come out. And you can see that they've kind of wore down like an embankment here so they can get down in there. Um, so with help from the Natural Resource Conservation Service and with the Long Tom Watershed Council, um, well, and actually Long Tom Watershed Council came in here first. I'll tell the story here. Um, this was with Natural Resource Conservation Service. And so what we did is we first put up a fence here um, to fence the cows out of the creek. 
Um, and then we went through and we planted, you can see in the foreground next to this little yellow flag, there's a little, um, looks like a pine tree. Um, and we, we planted in the first planting, we planted a few different species of trees. Um, there was, I, I think some poplar pine um, and some dug fir. Um, and what happened is that we had a lot of rodent issues, um, a lot of weed competition and pressures um, and a lot of it died. We had about 50% mortality. And then we talked to the long-term watershed council um, the next year and said, you know, we had a big problem with this. And they're like, you know, let's do a high density planning. Um, and, uh, and we planted a lot of stuff, you know, uh, wild rose and Oregon grape and, and lots of shrubs and trees um, and the density. And unfortunately in my rush to get this together, I didn't, I couldn't find a photo of, um, a current photo of what looks looks now, but it looks like if you look at this now, this is a jungle um, that you cannot see the water, which is a good thing um, because it means the water's being is, is shaded here. Um, so something you know, moving on from um, farming, this, this the next section is a bit about um, our place in the community, um, and I think we have to think about this. You know, what is agriculture and what are we, why is it important? Why is, why are local farms important? And why is it important for people to be connected with agriculture? And local farms are very tied into um, their communities. Um, and so um, one of the ways we tie into our community is we have an intern program. Um, and so the picture on the right, here's uh, someone who's, you know, hands-on experience in organic farming. It's like, okay, yeah, there's a lot of, um, heavy lifting and work, um, you know, feeding chickens um, and doing chores um, and working on the farm. And the interns um, stay on the farm uh, between, uh, most interns will stay for a year on the farm. And we have an apprenticeship program where interns can stay another year. Um, and then sometimes we have more short-term interns as well. Um, the picture on the left is uh, one of our apprentices, uh, Jeremy and an intern, Adam, who are doing a pig roast. So, they killed this pig themselves, roasted it themselves. And these two guys are actually uh, chefs um, that have come to the farm. So we're blessed to have a couple of chefs working on the farm. Um, and this pig roast is getting prepared for one of the farm dinners, but kind of an example of um, some of the activities that we're doing. Um, and here's, a, here's a, you know, a picture of a dinner from some of our CSA members, um, you know, getting together on the farm, eating food, um, we also have a homesteading group on the farm. Um, so, you know, we're looking at building a community with, um, with very young toddlers, um, young adults, teenagers, um, older people. Um, so we're engaged in, you know, natural building. So building um, cob houses as living structures, which are made from clay and sand and straw. Um, and, and getting the young, the young people involved in, um, farming and homesteading crafts and skills. Um, another way we're reaching out is through farmer's markets. So we have a weekly farmer's market stance in um, uh, Eugene, in the, the Lane County Farmer's Market. And we also do six markets in Portland uh, as well. But this is a great way to support, you know, many small markets, you know, so you're talking about, you know, again, the connection to climate change here is building resiliency in food systems. And so if you can support economically a resilient food system, and this represents a resilient food system. You know, you go to a farmer's market and you can see a hundred, you know, um, locally owned and operated small farms that are doing, many of the farms in our area are, are doing a lot of the same practices that we're doing. And they're all concerned about um, soil health and building soil fertility and wanting to make their, make their own system um, more resilient and able to adapt. Um, and here's, a, we also have a CSA, um, so this is my wife, Christine, and my daughter, Ella, and this is the first CSA boxes, and I think this was 2017, we started with 12 member families, um, and they're, they're the first boxes there, um, and now we've grown up to 350 families in 2021. Um, my wife likes to highlight, and she says this all the time, she's, she hates the word consumers, it's like we don't want consumers in our society, we want members or we want citizens. These, these are the words, you know, that describe um, how, how people can interact, you know, so like we, you know, people can say, well, you know, what can I do about climate change and farms? You know, like I'm not a farmer. How could I support it? It's like, well, 
you can join a CSA and you can get to know your local farms um, and, and try and promote some of these practices that I'm talking about here. Um, and it's a way, you know, and occasionally we have farm dinners. And so we're talking about, you know, building, you know, a resilient system that way. And I think that's, that's all the slides I have. Um, and I'm open, I don't know if any questions have come in, uh, but open to answering some more questions. Yeah, um, thanks, John, that was great. Um, going back to the extreme heat when it was in 110, 112 degrees, you, know, you, you mentioned that you all felt you weren't quite prepared for that and that you, you figured out some misting ways to keep the animals cool and things like that. What, what are some other takeaways that you've come away with for extreme heat events on what to do for the, for the animals to keep them comfortable? Because I, I remember you talking to me earlier and you're like, it's not just the apex 112 temperature, it's at nine o'clock in the morning, it might be 85 degrees yeah. already. And then yeah. they're exposed to a longer duration of time where it's really high heat and it, mm -hmm. the stress is longer. Uh, so it's more than just that high temperature. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for reminding me about that. I mean, that was, um, yeah, a big takeaway that, you know, I noticed on those really hot days that at, at 10 or 11 in the morning, it, it felt like, you know, four in the afternoon on a really hot day. And just thinking about what those animals are subjected to um, in terms of stress and, and actually, you know, so raising animals outside, I mean, it is, it is stressful. I mean, you can say um, um, that that's kind of like one of our key concerns, you know, how do we take care of, um, how do we take care of animals in this way? Um, so some of the things, you know, we've, we've been implementing ideas over the last five years. So, you know, another example of this for the laying hens is we built a, um, we realized that on really hot days, the sun comes up and it shines overhead. And if you have a feeder sitting outside, what the chickens do when it gets above 80 degrees is they're going to go hide in the shade, no matter what, they won't venture outside. And we had their food sitting in the outside. So on a really hot day, it means that chickens would not eat food. Mm. Um, so if you have a laying hen that doesn't eat food, um, but it's burning a lot of calories, what does it do? It stops laying eggs. And so then it becomes quickly um, not a very good proposition either for the chicken, they're not super comfortable or for the farmers. So we built a, a solar, we built a shade trailer for the chicken. So we've mounted mm. our um, feeders, you know, on a trailer that we can tow around and then built like, you know, a shade structure and an awning um, over the over the feed. So if the sun's shining directly overhead, well, they feel comfortable going over to their feed. Um, and same thing, you know, we've been experimenting with different types of water systems, you know, nipple waters versus trough waters and noticing that chickens seem to be adapted more naturally to drinking out of a trough water. So they see, you know, like water in a pool, they like to put their beaks down Mm -hmm. um, and, and then lift up and then they, they get water that way. And it actually seems like more of a natural action. If you think of a chicken, mm -hmm. um, naturally, I don't think chickens evolved drinking out of nipple waters. Nipple yeah. waters are an invention right. of people. You know? Probably not. So, so we've been like converting our waters into to trough waters as well too. Um, it, it helps keep it cooler and just to give them better access to it. So I, we've been doing, a, you know, trying to, you know, in order to cope with these extreme heat events, um, little things like that. Yeah. yeah. So you, you touched on, we've had the extreme heat, we've had the smoke, we've had the ice storm, we've had the snow. Uh, I'm sure they all pose very different challenges and they're all challenging their own way. Is there any one of those that is harder to overcome than, uh, than the others? We can debate this all day long. I think, um, it's usually the one that we're experiencing right then. That's the worst one. Like yeah. you know, during, during the, uh, the freezing temperatures is very difficult because it freezes up. You know, we're not acclimated. We're not like Minnesota where you expect to have, you know, freezing temperatures continuously, you know, in Western Oregon, um, we're kind of used to a fairly mild, a fairly mild climate. Um, so we have, you know, a lot of our systems are built in kind of like open air barns, you know, during the winter time, or maybe they're still out on pasture, you know, so the colder things get, you know, it's harder. So, um, you know, freezing, our freezing protocol is, it takes probably, um, you know, an hour and a half at night to kind of like frost proof, 
um, our animals. And then you got to go back in the morning and then you got to unfrost proof. Um, so it's cold. You're wandering around and it's very cold and you're, you know, turning water off and then you're draining hoses and you're blowing air through them. And, um, and then in the morning you wake up and you got to do the reverse. And sometimes everything gets so cold. You know, there was one morning where it was, I think minus 12 degrees Fahrenheit here. Oh, wow. Um, and I remember that morning was, you know, I'm dumping water into pans. No other water system was working. We had to pull water out of the pond, um, put it in a tank, and then we dumped water under the ground into pans. And um, the chickens would start drinking. But 20 minutes later, the pans were frozen. So then you knock the frozen water out, and then you got to refill the water. You know, so that was pretty. That was that was pretty hard. Um, mm. But I think you know maybe the extreme heat is maybe more scary. And I think that what's more scary about the extreme heat is that it's coupled with um, fire danger. Um, mm -hmm. And it just, you know, it is that you have to have your A game on as a farmer in order to survive this. So you can't, you can't make any mistakes. And, and one mistake on the farmer end will, will translate to, to, you know, mortalities for the animals. So it, it, it requires extreme vigilance and, and it's not the same with, with the freezing weather. It's more just a pain in the butt. It's just, you know, you just yeah. got to get water out to them and you just, you know, just got to keep working. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing, you know, but is, is more normal. is just the very cold rains, you know, so mm -hmm. the, the things that happen in the winter, you know, and this is, this is more common for our climate where you have 35 degrees Fahrenheit and raining for, you know, a couple of weeks on end. And that, that is hard in animals too, because it ends up penetrating. It becomes a little easier, you know, if it's a little colder or if snow or something like that, because at least they're dry. So I would say after all this, you know, thinking about this, I would say the extreme heat is, that's the one I fear the most. Yeah, no, that's great. That provides great context for all of it. Um, with so much at stake, like you're talking about, you kind of, it seems like have to learn very quickly how to adapt on the fly do you all have trusted resources or peer networks you go to where you're learning from each other? Um, where, where are you getting information and, and sharing information in a way that's helping you all get through this? Are you, are you kind of having to figure it all out on your own? Um, that's a great question. I think there's a little bit of, uh, of all of that, um, that there are some organizations we, uh, we belong to a grazing group for the last um 20 years um, where we talk about grazing techniques and principles in Oregon. Um, also belong to a, um, the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association, which is an email mm -hmm. listserv type thing where you can ask questions. And we've gained a lot of help from that, um, you know, and asking other farmers. Um, but we've also, you know, a lot just relied on ourselves and our own network and community. Um, on the farm, we get together every morning at, at 7 a.m., Actually, we get to get the managers get together at 6.45 a.m., have a 15 minute pre-meeting. And then we get together at 7 a.m. to have an all farm meeting. Um, and so we've gotten very organized about this, about all the different people, you know, on the farm. So like any one day we'll have maybe we'll have 10, 15 people here on the farm. Um, so how do we communicate all the information and everything that's going on? It's like, you know, I, I heard a pig coughing or I, I, I noticed that the feed consumption's down or, you know, and then we need to communicate with whoever's on the ground and, and doing chores. Um, you know, so we have chore boards for each enterprise where we write down, here's what's happening. Here's what you need to do. Here's, here's what you can watch out for. Um, so kind of systematizing this um, has taken a lot of work from, from my wife and I over the last um, years. You know, when we first started, it was just us and the kids. You know, so we didn't have any chore boards and it was just us. You, know, you just go out and just do the chores. You know, it's not not a lot of paperwork involved. So now there's a lot of, there's a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of, um, a lot of meetings um, to convey information. Um, and that's how we organize, um, you know, in kind of the big system, we have so many different operations and they're all, you know, kind of significant in number, um, you know, the quantity of animals we have. So um, it's always, a, um, you know, us and the team working together, trying to figure this out. Yeah. Spreadsheets and meetings. That sounds very similar to my days. And I, I bet a lot of folks that aren't in the farming community probably don't realize just how much of all that coordination and organizing on the back end goes into every single day. So that, that's great that you were able to share all that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else we might have here. So uh, keeping on that resources 
an information vein. Are, are there any sorts of new innovations that you wish would like, oh, if I only had this, this would make this so much easier. Or is there any resource group or kind of collaborating entity you really wish was there to kind of provide information or is there anything lacking, I guess, is the question that you wish was out there? Uh, well, there's so much that's lacking. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of different directions you can go with it. I think that, um, some of the some of the big ways is just to realize bringing how do we bring food to market and um, supporting that supply chain um, that there's a lot of expectations placed on farmers about um, you know how do we you know what's the right way to handle products and how do how can we process this and comply with regulations um, you know so we raise birds on the ground and 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 we need to bring it to people in urban areas um, and it needs to be um, properly packaged, sealed, properly cleaned, processed, um, stored and delivered um, with an appropriate label. Um, and it sounds like, okay, sure, but it, there's, there's so many different small things in there to comply with um, you know, uh, county, state, federal regulations um, and how you how you do this and to do it the right way. And so I think, pro, you know, aid in processing um, and, and working to um, make sure that we can, you know, do this not only well, you know, but also following, um, following the rules. And, you know, a lot, and oftentimes the rules um, and doing things well aren't always the same thing. Um, so, you know, I think help with navigating, um, navigating regulations and help with um, processing, um, you know, that there is, there's been a big challenge um, and constant pressure on processors. Um, uh, if we use third-party processors, um, we've used um, uh, Mohawk uh, Valley Meats and we've used Revel and we've used um, Carlton. We've used a lot of different processors. We've used probably 10 different processors in the Valley. And all of them have been under severe strain. And when you talk to them, the processors are chronically overworked and overwhelmed. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't know how they do it. Um, and so that's, that's been a, you know, a challenge for us. And so we raise animals and we have to, you know, there's so many, you know, we go to market and people want to go there and buy a ribeye steak or they want to buy um, sausages. But how do we know, you know, in order to get that sausage there, we have to make sure, first of all, that we're planning our pig numbers appropriately and we have the slaughter groups. And even if we do everything perfectly, we still may not be able to get that sausage to, to the market because maybe the processors shut down. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe there's a truck that's broke down. Maybe the further processor we use for, um, you know, putting sausages together, um, you know, is closed down. Um, and so we've encountered all these things. And, and these things have become, you know, more severe in the last couple of years as well. You know, yeah. so I showed a lot of pictures about climate um, in the last couple of years, but obviously COVID has been a thing too, that's been driving a lot of supply chain issues, um, which we felt, but we felt those supply chain issues that were present before COVID. And I, I don't think even if we saw COVID that things are going to get better. I, I foresee things as, as getting harder in this way oh. for small farmers. So I think oh. this is probably, this is probably the biggest bottleneck um, that we're facing. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea. That's great to know. I, um, yeah, I, I would have assumed that uh, the pandemic had exacerbated things, of course. But uh, yeah, the, the fact that, that those supply chain issues and um, staffing issues have been going on even before that. Yeah, that's. Um, so you, you're an organic farm, obviously. And I'm wondering, are there unique challenges or specific challenges that come to trying to tackle these sorts of issues while also being an organic farm that you might not experience in a conventional farm? I actually see being an organic farm as an enormous opportunity hmm. um, that we're in, we're doing things the way that they need to get done. And it's just a, it's just a question of, um, um, you know, when will things write themselves 
um, you know, in, in the bigger pictures, you know, and, and one story now is, you know, the extremely high cost of um, nitrogen fertilizers. So synthetic, synthetic fertilizer costs have, I think, tripled, um, or maybe even quadrupled um, wow. in the last year and a half. Um, and we don't buy that. So I hear stories about other, you know, conventional farmers, like, what am I going to do? You know, the price of urea has gone from, you know, 200 to a thousand. Um, and I, I just, I, yeah, I don't know. Good luck with that. Yeah, we don't use it. So, um, you know, we've been trying to build soil fertility and get the soil um, to, 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 to provide for us. And it does, it works. You know, this is something that we've seen massive increases in productivity on our own farm where we're, we're seeing soil organic matters going up, um, our productivity is going up. Um, and so things are, it, and it's taken a while. You know, when we first started, um, people said, you're, you know, we're the, you're surely going to fail. You can't grow animals this way. You need to, you need to fertilize um, and, and you need to use a lot of the other products, um, conventional products as well, uh, in order to be successful. Um, and in the first few years, my wife and I kind of looked at each other and said, well, gosh, maybe they're right, you know, because we are, are the, the fields were like um, drug addicted, um, you know, like they're drug addicts, you know, like they expected to get, you know, so much urea, it's just like they had been, you know, twice a year for the past 50 years. And then we stopped doing that. And all of a sudden, you got all these grasses here, who don't know how to you know, pull nutrients out of the soil on their own. Um, so you need to build, you know, rebuild that system. And it took, you know, three or four years. And then we started seeing, you know, more and more gains, um, you know, so those pictures of us, you know, manure spreading and the pictures of us moving animals, you know, from spot to spot, that stuff really does work. I mean, it's not just, um, it's not just a theory, it, 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 it does work. So I think that, you know, as far as, you know, being organic, um, I think it's a big asset, you know, yeah. uh, when we're working, when we're looking at climate change issues. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the practices that you were just talking about a few minutes ago are feeding into that resilience that you're, that you're talking about trying to build resilience in your farm. And a, and a lot of those have been through the, the practices that you've implemented, that you've figured out over the years. Um, and a lot of them are not super, you know, I mean, I think I, like I say, like, it's not, extremely novel it's just like a lot of it is just good farming practices you know and just like it's like those extreme heat days you know we were talking about like you have to be on your a game you know like to to weather you know 112 degrees um and you can't do anything wrong <laughs> so it's the same thing you know just like farming in general it's like yeah you have to be on your a game when you're farming because you'll know it as soon as you do something wrong it's like oh yeah we messed up yeah. Um, so kind of wrapping up here, you all are, of course, a family farm. Um, what's your hope for the future? Uh, do, you, do you, is part of your goal to have your, your children and their children keep doing what you're doing? Well, that is the goal. Yes. We, we started this farm um, in large part for our children. Um, and you know, that that was something that, um, you know, like when we first started, and I think that what we've seen over the years that the one thing that has surprised me so much is that how much it's grown into more than just our family, but a really um, a community effort, mm -hmm. and how how it involves so many people um, that have come either as interns who come from all over the world, and how we've built relationships in our local community. Um, and so my hope, my sincerest hope is that we can build an economy that supports our type of farm and that supports local farms like this, um, that we can move away from monocultures and we can move away from, you know, mass production and we can move away from the, the slaughter facilities that does, you know, 5,000 cows, you know, a day type of thing. And then we can move towards uh, more independent um, you know, slaughter facilities, more independent family farms and uh, more independent feed providers. And, you know, the, the list goes on and on, you know, how you build a, a culture um, that, that, can, that can build resiliency. Yeah, we have a, a special thing here in the watershed where 
so much of our area is with family farms and ranches and orchards. Um, you know, me coming from the Midwest, uh, we didn't have quite as much of that. They were all very, very much bigger. You know, that, that that's fine. Um, you know, there's there's a spectrum of, uh, of farming, of course, and it's, it's all valuable. But, you know, just seeing all the, the family farms in this area and uh, what people are doing, it's a, I think it's a good thing. Um, anything else you wanted to touch on, John, that we might have missed? I can't think of anything right now. I mean, I think that might be a good note to to stop right there, unless there's any other last questions. I don't think so. Um, really appreciative of your time and your stories and anecdotes and articulating what it's like in the day on the farm. I think that's one of the most valuable things for people who may not know or ha have family in farms is, you know, what is it like? And what are the considerations and what are the challenges? And that's really one of the key things we wanted to bring to people around the community with this series is what do people have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? What are things that people are thinking of now that they might not have had to think of years before uh, all of a sudden are creating challenges? And, you know, like you said, we're all part of this cycle of building resilience in our communities and, uh, Supporting all these local farms right here in the watershed is, is definitely one way to do that. Um, let's see, just to kind of wrap up here. And I guess I'll just, I mean, I just would give a big thank you to the Longtown Watershed Council and for the support that you've given us and to other farms and to really see that this has been a, a vital part. I can see the, the watershed is kind of a nerve network, um, you know, um, of all the farms, you know, like the farms, you know, all rely on water and, um, you know, in the creeks and supporting, you know, clean water and supporting, um, you know, the uplands as well and building healthy habitats has been, you know, super valuable. So thank you for that. Yeah. And likewise, really grateful to you and your family for all the voluntary work that you've done with us over the years, um, a multi-pronged restoration project, and you've been great partners for many, many years here. Um, I do want to remind people again that uh, we do hope to get Tiffany Monroe uh, and get her perspective sometime in the near future. That could be um, another video like this or one where we just record it and put it up on YouTube. So uh, Tiffany, just to give you some real quick background. She's a fifth generation farmer who grows with her family hazelnuts, hay, and also raises cattle. Uh, her farm's near Junction City. And she's also currently the president of Lane Families for Farms and Forests, and also the president of the Lane County Oregon Farm Bureau. So this broadcast, of course, this will be up on our YouTube channel and will, and will remain there. That's the youtube.com slash long tom WSC. And um, yeah, really grateful again, John, for you taking the time to share your stories with us. Thanks to you and your family. Happy New Year, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Rob.